So, last talk of the day. Uh, you know what I just realized? I somewhat uh, recently became an engineering manager. So I guess that makes me the final boss of TSConf. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been super exciting hearing so many great things today about TypeScript. And I hope you all learned a lot because I definitely did. But now I have to ask you a very difficult question. How are you going to bring back all of these cool ideas back to work? And how are you going to convince your team to adopt uh, TypeScript or these new ideas? So I'm going to share a couple of stories about influence, and in the second half of my talk, my take on how to use TypeScript effectively. So when I first started my career as a software engineer, like many others before me, I thought that the only thing that mattered was the code. What I cared about then was my mastery of different programming paradigms and patterns, and in hindsight, useless trivia that was overly specific about the hottest JavaScript framework that nobody uses anymore. So I used to struggle with not being able to communicate my ideas and influence change. I mean, sure, I knew a lot about code and best practices and whatnot, but when it came to influence, I was stumped. I was frustrated and I was unhappy. So you might know or even work with someone like this, or maybe you've struggled with this problem as well. So let me start with a story of how I gained this insight many years ago. I remember one time I was excited about a new programming language called Elixir. It was functional, it had cool features like pattern matching or immutability, and I learned a ton about distributed systems. So I thought it was such a great language, and I still do. And naturally, I had a burning desire to write everything in it. So when I started a new job, I tried convincing my new manager how good Elixir was. I knew a lot about it, having uh, worked on a number of Elixir projects at a previous company, so I tried to sell him on all the things that I thought were compelling performance, fault tolerance, decades of research behind the Erlang virtual machine, and how easy it was to learn coming from someone with a JavaScript and Ruby background. But the truth is, I had, the, the truth is I had no idea how to convince my manager that this was something we needed. All I knew was Elixir was a great language, and selfishly, I wanted to use it as, at work because I thought it was better than whatever it was we were using. But I couldn't articulate why. Fortunately for the business, he didn't see it that way. These were not problems that needed solving. And that was a good thing. It would have been a mistake to adopt Elixir at the time. I learned something invaluable that day. Up to that point, I had prioritized my programming ability and knowledge about programming languages above everything else. But none of that really mattered when I tried to influence change within the organization I was in, because I didn't know how to connect those changes to how we would impact the business and to the things that frustrated or motivated my team. The thing I was missing was the ability to influence, and it really limited my effectiveness as a software engineer. The insight I gained many years ago is how important it is to your growth to amplify your technical abilities with the powers of influence and leadership so that you can have a wider uh, impact within and even outside of your organization. So if I could give you an elevator pitch about my talk in the form of a tweet, I'd pick this one by Kate Heddleston. She says, a 10x engineer isn't someone who is 10x better than those around them, but someone who makes those around them 10x better. It's really not enough just to focus on code. Code's awesome, but developing leadership and influence is really key as you grow more senior in your career. So before we dive in, let me show you where we are with type systems where I currently work. I started working at Netflix three years ago as a full stack engineer, and today I am a manager leading a team of 12 UI engineers within the Studio UI organization. We're building great user experiences for Hollywood and the global entertainment industry in order to help Netflix entertain more than 150 million members around the world. So you might have seen this little cat just now on the sticker table. My team is the Studio UI Foundations team, and we work on three foundational areas for the business. So firstly, we're creating tools that um, allow us to discover and manage all of the creative workforce that works on our original content. Second, we're giving that workforce the best possible experience of working with Netflix. And finally, we're connecting all of our applications together in the studio uh, through a shared studio workflow. Pretty much everything we use in the team has a type system somewhere. Our UIs are written in React and TypeScript. We will soon access data through a GraphQL gateway. 
and behind the scenes, JVM-based microservices communicate with each other through gRPC. But before we got to type system paradise, uh, several teams within Netflix had to make the case for adopting type to JavaScript. So each of those teams had a few requirements in mind uh, for choosing a type system. And one common requirement was developer productivity. They wanted to be able to move faster and with more confidence, uh, for example, in the form of IDE support, uh, such as auto completion and error messaging, as well as better understanding of our APIs and contracts. Um, as well as improved documentation because we would find that JS doc based comments would often fall out of date. Bugs in production are obviously expensive, so teams also wanted to reduce bugs uh, by leveraging a type system to catch them before our users did. As we considered different type systems, we wanted one that would fail in proper usage of code and libraries quickly and with effective messaging, harden contracts that we had through type safety, and also allow us to uh, leverage community types to ensure that we were using third-party libraries correctly. An interesting side benefit of type JavaScript we identified as well is that it can sometimes, but not always, encourage you to write code that performs better when executed on JavaScript engines. For example, type to JavaScript can encourage developers to write code that has consistent object shapes. So functions in JavaScript that take in consistently shaped objects are more easily optimized by uh, JavaScript engines such as V8. And this article I've linked here by uh, Vyacheslav, who used to work on V8 at Google, goes into more detail on this topic. So there's a link below, and I'll share a link to my slides at the end of the talk. Because most of the backend languages and technologies we use in Netflix are typed or have uh, or make use of a type schema, we also wanted to use a language on the front end that would allow us to take advantage of those same types so that we can uh, better improve the integration and harden the contract between libraries and services uh, provided by other engineering teams. Benefits aside, teams also knew about potential risks and concerns. For example, uh, needing more plumbing to support uh, static, uh, static typing. Second, uh, there was actually a chance we could reduce developer productivity in the form of fighting type errors that were due to inaccurate type definitions or people who didn't use DTS lint uh, and not actual code errors. And also we considered that adoption could be really weak, meaning that the benefits of things like typed contracts wouldn't be available. So we considered both TypeScript and Flow for these use cases, and for the most part, TypeScript fit the bill better. So many of our teams at Netflix chose TypeScript as their type system. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Uh, converting to TypeScript for some teams was challenging, depending on the size and complexity of their code base. Uh, some of them encountered edge cases that required clever usage of TypeScript, like binary arithmetic, I guess. And at times, TypeScript errors could be really verbose and cumbersome, uh, making it difficult to find the cause. One thing that really helped teams at Netflix make the decision to use TypeScript was uh, an organically growing community within Netflix. So I created the TypeScript Slack channel in my first week at Netflix because one, I really liked TypeScript, and two, I knew how important it would be to have a strong community if we wanted to have momentum and build greater adoption of TypeScript within the company. The TypeScript Slack channel turned out to be <laughs> a great way for people passionate about it to share the knowledge, and of course, memes, um, especially when it comes to esoteric error messages or challenges with complex types in internal libraries and tools. And that sense of community really helped drive adoption for TypeScript uh, and Netflix. And I also started the TypeScript and Netflix meetup for employees earlier this year, and we started meeting monthly to discuss how to improve adoption. So this meetup was actually really great because it was a great opportunity for a lot of the engineers within the company to practice their public speaking skills, and we saw a great number of uh, really interesting talks come out of it. So all of this work culminated in a strategic bet that the Studio UI team made this year. We made a qualitative bet to prefer static typing and, uh, sorry, static typing for our applications and libraries across our whole organization because we believe the developer productivity benefits were really difficult to ignore. So it wasn't easy to get this level of adoption within the company, and it was definitely not possible for one person to do so in a company the size of Netflix. It took us a few years to get here, and it was really only possible because a community of engineers banded together to make a case for it. 
So as you, if you think about bringing TypeScript and all of these cool ideas back, think about ways that you can also build a community within uh, the company that you work at. Because it will greatly help with accelerating adoption and it's far more effective than going solo. So, quick show of hands if you learned something new about TypeScript today and you want to bring it back to your team. Nice. But don't get too excited yet. <laughs> I know this is TSConf and you're all excited about going back, introducing TypeScript, and <laughs> turning on strict mode on day one so that you can inflict maximum pain on your team. But before you do that, consider this. Before you even start talking about TypeScript and all the cool ideas that you heard about, I want you to take a step back and think about the actual problem that you're trying to solve. I've been there before, so here's some advice. Don't be the person with a solution in search of a problem. Before you try to convince your team to use TypeScript or map types or conditional types or whatever, you need to accept that TypeScript may not be the actual solution that's best for the problem that you want to solve, and that's okay. In other words, don't make your argument about TypeScript specifically. Make it about the organization and the team that you're working on, because that subtle shift in mindset will make all the difference, and you'll have a much greater chance of success. Thanks, Drake. There's gonna be two key things people wanna know. Firstly, what is the impact? Are we gonna really catch more bugs before we ship? Are we going to move slower because nobody knows TypeScript yet? And secondly, how sustainable is this change? If you're the only person in your team who knows TypeScript and no one else is willing to learn it, then who's gonna maintain the applications and the code that you write if you go on vacation or if you leave the company? Nobody wants to take on that risk. So think about those two points, impact and sustainability, as we chat about influence. What is influence anyway? Influence isn't easily defined. However, it's definitely learnable and essential skill as you grow more senior as an engineer. It took me a really long time to make all of these points start with C, so I hope you appreciate my hard work. Uh, but here's my take on how to uh, have influence. I believe you need five things. You need context. You need to be able to connect the dots. You need to be narrow in your choice. You need to build a connection and you need to establish credibility. I'll get to the last one later. So context. Context is all about listening and awareness. It's the frame in which you look at a problem. If you stand too close, then all you see are the details and you risk being distracted by little problems that don't really matter. And you'll miss out on the bigger picture. And missing the big picture isn't great because you could be trying to solve a problem that really isn't that impactful in the grand scheme of things like my example earlier in trying to introduce Elixir to solve problems that uh, didn't exist. Building context means taking the time to step away from your precious keyboard and speaking to people, which can be really uncomfortable to start, but remember, your job isn't just to write code, it's to solve problems. And problems often relate to people, whether it's your team or your users. So go out there and talk to your peers, your manager, your PM, your designer. Your goal is to understand what's frustrating for them and what motivates them. You'll find that the people that you talk to will have different frustrations, and that's okay. Your goal is to listen and not to jump to any solutions or conclusions just yet. You're gathering information so that you can figure out what to do next. When you've gathered enough context, it's time to put on your thinking hat and try and connect the dots for people. Connecting the dots is really about stepping back, thinking about the context that you've gathered, and looking at the big picture. What's the common thing you're hearing? What are people saying in between the lines? And what are people not saying? Because sometimes that's important. As you start considering the landscape of what's working well and what isn't, you'll better understand what the problems really are and what you find might surprise you. It could be something that you hadn't thought about before. If you really wanna make a wide impact, connect what the problems are to your company's ability to make money. Everybody likes money. Because ultimately, that connection to the business should be your driving goal. Now, choice is interesting. I learned this in a one-on-one -on -one with uh, my previous VP of engineering, and he shared this quote with me that stuck with me ever since. That strategy is really about knowing what not to do. I'm talking about strategy here because at this point, if you've talked to a bunch of people, you probably have discovered a bunch of things that aren't working great. But realistically, you're not gonna be able to solve them all. So which one do you choose? Think about the context that you've gathered and get some feedback on what that most uh, impactful thing might be. 
And once you've chosen the problem, keep it simple. Make sure that people agree with you that it's a problem in the first place and that it's the right problem to solve today. Keeping it focused will increase your chances of success because trying to solve many problems at the same time is only gonna dilute your effort and make you less effective. Finally, we have connection. Connection is the hard people stuff that ties us all together. So take it from, uh, from someone who's been an introvert and painfully shy most of her life uh, that it's possible to learn. My take is that connection is really all about being genuine, thoughtful, and communicating well, whether it's in writing or in speech. For example, being transparent about your frustrations and motivations will go a long way. If you want to introduce TypeScript or conditional types or whatever, because it's going to be better for productivity, be honest. Your PMs and your partners should be aligned with wanting more productivity. Everybody wants more velocity, but messaging it in the right way and communicating uh, the cost to engineering is really key to getting buy-in. So let me illustrate these four Cs with another story, which isn't about type systems, but the lessons apply as well. So one of the applications I worked on when I first started at Netflix uh, was an application that aggregated data from lots of different microservices, and it had a very highly dynamic UI to slice and dice that uh, data. So think filtering, think search, think custom query builders, and this was all so that our studio uh, could use that information to optimize when to launch our content on the service. After speaking to a bunch of people from different teams, uh, we soon realized that you know, the architecture we started with was not going to scale to continue getting more data for our application from the many microservices we had available. Essentially, we had to do a bespoke integration with each, with each service to extract, transform, and load that data into our system which was both time consuming and brittle because whenever the API contract would inevitably change, our application would break without warning. But it was really important to the business that you know, the more data that we could surface in this application would really, uh, result in better decision making. So we mulled on it for a while and one evening in a fit of frustration, I wrote up a lengthy document, surprise, describing the problem and some solutions I had in mind. Now the solution itself isn't the point of the story, but my mistake with that document was focusing it all about the solution and uh, not the problem. I shared it out, I got good feedback, but you know, nobody really agreed that this was a problem we needed to solve right now. In hindsight, I was thinking too far ahead. The organization just wasn't ready for a solution of that scale. But fast forward two years later, and we're now at the point where it makes sense to solve this problem. So even though the answer then was not now, the problems that we helped uncover have really informed the new solution, and we were able to start a conversation about it with many different teams. Now, in the second half of my talk, I wanna share my take on how to build credibility by going deeper into why you should care about type systems. Knowing how to influence is key, but knowing your subject is also important, so here's my take on why you should care about type systems. In the immortal words of Anders, uh, it's better to find errors before the space shuttle flies. What Anders is alluding to is that most high-level programming languages, even the dynamically typed ones, are type-checked. The difference is, if you're willing to make the trade-off of being a little bit more verbose in your code, statically typed languages can give you a chance to find errors in your program before it even runs. I wanna share with you one key lesson I've learned about using TypeScript uh, effectively. So if you try to distill what a type is into an underlying definition, one definition is that a type is a set of possible values. In this example, the type string is the set of all possible strings, and the type number is the set of all possible numbers, which by the way, includes not a number. Surprise, surprise. If we combine the two, we have what is known, known as a union type. And if you remember set theory at all, it's called that way because a union type of string and number is the union of the set of all strings and the set of all numbers. So when we talk about types, one thing I like to keep in mind is the number of values possible within that type. And that number is known as cardinality. So here's an example where the cardinality of the type is uh, finite. In this case, the cardinality is three because it can only be one of three possible values. This option type has a cardinality of two because it can only be one of uh, two possible values. Unknown, however, is the supertype of every other type, so its cardinality is infinite. What that means is that the unknown type can match the entire universe of types available to you 
in your TypeScript application. And that's the same story with the any type. So because of that, you'll find that most people will caution you against using unknown and any, uh, surprisingly, um, because you lose a lot of type safety if you overuse them. If you haven't realized by now, my, the title of my talk is sarcastic, so don't use any. <laughs> but wait, why is this math stuff important? I'm talking about cardinality because it's much easier to reason about a type whose cardinality is smaller. And as we saw kind of a little bit earlier today, the more precision you have with your types, the more accurate you are, the more you'll get out of your type system and hopefully the less bugs you'll see in production. So the next time you pick a type, I want you to think about how you can be a little bit more precise. Instead of just using a string, could you use a string literal? Instead of a number, do you want to or need to encode more meaning? Is it, uh, does the number represent a currency? Is it mass? Is it someone's age? Let me illustrate this with an example. We have a function here which calls the toString method on the object that's passed into it. But even though null and undefined do not have toString uh, defined on them, this will type check. And this means that you've lost type safety, uh, and this will cause a type error if you run this code. So this is an example where we're not being as precise with our types as we could be. So to make this better, we can add a type constraint to narrow the possible types this function will ex accept. And we do this with the non-nullable type. It tells TypeScript to exclude nulls and undefines from the generic type T. And now, assuming that everything else has two strings defined, we've made our code a little bit safer. And if you want to get even more precise, you could use an intersection type to ensure that the argument really has two string defined on it, but it might be excessive. If you're a visual thinker like myself, we're essentially subtracting the nullable types from the set of all types, leaving us only the non-nullable types. And in the more precise definition, we're also intersecting the non-nullable types with the types that have two string defined to return a string. If you like this nerdy math stuff, uh, I go into more detail about this in another talk, so check it out if you're interested, and there's also a link to this at the bottom. So all that said, what use is there if TypeScript, touch wood, is this wood, uh, is going to be abandoned someday? I can't make any promises about its longevity, but, uh, and maybe the TypeScript team can answer this later, but in my view, TypeScript is doing really great at being sustainable for the long term. So not that it means anything by itself, but a lot of you use TypeScript today, and it's one of the fastest growing programming languages in 2019 by public usage. Um, and I'm a manager, so you know, when managers think about programming languages, a lot of the time it boils down to a couple of simple questions. And one of the questions is, can I hire great engineers who know this language or can learn it? And so what I'm trying to say here is that in TypeScript's uh, case, there is a pretty good chance of that. Another of my favorite things about TypeScript, as uh, you've seen many times today, uh, is the very passionate community chipping in to help uh, add types to libraries that don't ship type definitions, which is a really genius way to encourage the adoption of TypeScript, and I'm really proud of what our community has achieved. So you all deserve a big round of applause. If you're still on the fence, it's pretty low risk giving TypeScript a try. For example, if you already have JS doc style comments in your code, you can take advantage of TypeScript's type checker, even if you're not going to convert any of your files to TypeScript just yet, meaning that you could benefit from TypeScript without ever writing a line of it. That's pretty awesome. And best of all, for the truly skeptical, <laughs> TypeScript has type erasure, meaning that it removes type annotations, interfaces, aliases, so on during compilation. So in, the, you know, in the, the scenario where Microsoft or abandons TypeScript and you really want to go back to JavaScript, in theory, you could use the compiled JavaScript as your source of truth. Uh, it might not be that simple in practice, but my point is that it's not impossible. But if you had used something like ReasonML or Elm or something uh, else that compiles to JavaScript and that gets abandon abandoned, then it's a, a probably a much harder transition. As we come to a close, I want you to leave you with this reminder. In order to have great impact as an engineer, it's really more than just the code. Think about the problems your team is facing and don't be the person with a solution in search of a problem. Yep, <laughs> that wasn't me. If you can agree that something's a problem, then thinking about or talking about solutions is a waste of time. And even so, there are probably many different ways to solve that problem. 
So don't box yourself in with one specific solution. When it comes to TypeScript, don't fixate on the language. Instead, make it about the organization that you're on and your team. And understand what the pros and cons of TypeScript would be. TypeScript is absolutely not a silver bullet. It's not gonna solve all your problems. It's not gonna do your taxes. But you might find it helpful in improving productivity, reducing bugs, encouraging keeping documentation up to date, and to some extent, maybe even performance. Knowing how to effectively maximize your usage of TypeScript and communicate its pros and cons will help others see its value because uh, you're absolutely gonna need the support of people to make these kinds of wide changes uh, in your organization. It's also important to consider the sustainability of the technology that you choose. Um, there isn't a ton of risk giving TypeScript a try, and there are many paths to success with TypeScript. Uh, you don't even have to go all in with it if you don't want to, and you can benefit from type checking without writing any TypeScript at all. And finally, as you go about problem solving, remember to seek out context, connect the dots, be narrow in your choices, connect with people uh, by being genuine and establish credibility. You might get no or not now for an answer, but you'll be well on your way to amplifying the impact you have within your organization. And if you're lucky, you might convince people to try out TypeScript. So send me your questions and comments on Twitter. Uh, there are two links below you can check out to read my rambling on my blog uh, and to download my slides. The slides are available at bit.ly slash just use any. You've been all superb listeners, so please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.